Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Debbie Pfister, and I am Research Assistant Professor with the Ackerman Center and the Bass School of Arts, Humanities, and Technology here at UT Dallas. Um, we are thrilled to welcome you to our Veteran Day lecture, and very much appreciate that you've come out on a beautiful Sunday afternoon um, to enjoy this lecture by Professor McManus. And I promise for those of you who are Dallas Cowboy fans, we will get you out in plenty of time after cupcakes to make it home for the game. Um, I guess, is that a good thing? Are we winning? Okay. I never know if it's a good thing or a bad thing. Um, before we begin our program, however, I'd like to take this opportunity to thank our partner for this event, the Dallas Jewish Federation of Greater, uh, Jewish Federation of Greater Dallas, I gotta get the name right, um, as well as Dean Romer, who is always very supportive of our new ideas, however crazy they may be, and sometimes they're pretty far out there. So thank you very much for always supporting us. Um, and also to Cindy and Bonnie, who are probably some here running around, who really are the reason that we keep going, because they do all the, the heavy lifting. Um, on this Veterans Day weekend, as we find ourselves in a world that is growing ever more dangerous, we're reminded of how much we owe those who serve. We express our deep deepest gratitude to you and to your families for your selflessness and the sacrifices you've made to make, make the world a better place and to ensure that we live in safety and security. Now it's my pleasure to introduce you to my partner in crime, um, my colleague Marshall Coleman, who is going to introduce you to Dr. McManus. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Fister, for everything. Um, first off, I would like to thank Dean Romer. Um, the, the best part about working for Dr. Romer is that uh, he gives us the freedom to be creative. And so Dr. Fister and I and Cindy uh, are constantly coming out with new programs, new lecture series, and bringing in the top scholars um, from around the world. So thank you, Dr. Romer. Um, Dr. Fister, thank you so much for allowing this to come into fruition. We started this program about three years ago for Veterans Day. Um, I came across Dr. McManus about 10 years ago. Um, Dr. Fister and I were creating a new class, and I was doing research, and I came across a book that he wrote um, called Grunts, The American Infantry Combat Experience, World War II Through Iraq. And being in the infantry myself, this book um, obviously resonated for me right off the bat, and so I've been following his career ever since then. He doesn't know, but I have a secret crush on him and his work, <laughs> but I think he knows now. So, um, Dr. John C. McManus is an award-winning professor, author, and military historian, and a leading expert in the history of the American combat experience. What's great about his work is that we're coming into an age now where the survivor, the liberator, they won't be around anymore. Um, this is a very important age where they can't defend, you know, what they went through or express their, their feelings. So. What he does is so great is he gives voice to the combat veteran through his work. And uh, I think it's so important, like I said, with the age that we're coming into now. So thank you. Dr. McManus is the Curator's Distinguished Professor of U.S. Military History at the Missouri University of Science and Technology. This professorship is bestowed by the University of Missouri Board of Curators as the most outstanding scholar in the University Missouri system. Professor McManus is the first ever Missouri s and faculty member in the humanities to be named Curator Distinguished Professor. So with that, I would like to introduce and welcome Dr. McManus. Thank you. Thanks, Marshall. Appreciate it. Thanks to all of you. Um, don't know about that crush, but we'll have to talk about that later. But <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, I greatly appreciate that wonderful introduction. Um, I'd like to add my own uh, appreciation and thanks to all veterans uh, for your service and for everything you've made this country and, and continue to do so. Um, very much appreciate that. I'd like to thank all the, the good folks at the Ackerman Center for, uh, for inviting me here, for, for you know, taking care of so many details. Uh, it's such a pleasure and an honor to be here. And I'd like to thank all of you for making time on a, uh, on a game Sunday to come here and listen to, to me. So 
Um, my verbal warning label, of course, is a lot of what we'll talk about today, or what I'll show you, is not pleasant. And I suspect we all know and realize that, especially here. But uh, um, that is the reality of the situation. Some of it's going to be difficult, and there's no uh, harm and no shame in being upset. And I think that includes me, too. So um, where to begin this, this discussion? Uh, well, almost 80 years ago, if you can imagine this, uh, there was a sort of temperate spring afternoon, April 4th, 1945. Uh, a uh, young lieutenant by the name of Robert Cleary, who was a recon platoon leader in the 89th Infantry Division, uh, was at the vanguard of a combined arms task force uh, that's moving east in Germany, ever, ever eastward, of course, as the, you have this last phase of the war and you're trying to eliminate German resistance and just get to the end of this thing. So they were operating um, uh, kind of in, the, in the, the sort of this portion of Germany here, the, uh, the Weimar portion of Germany. Uh, again, just kind of moving toward an objective deeper into the, uh, into the Third Reich, as so many United States Army formations were, were operating at that point. And uh, this map from the West Point Atlas gives you a sense of that. It's a busy map, but it does show you sort of the end point. And so uh, Cleary and his guide, somewhere near the, the village of Ordruf, um, noticed a shocking and unexpected sight that they really could have never imagined. Uh, along either side of the road, they saw emaciated corpses just laying there in ditches. Uh, and they were, the, the clothes were in ragged, uh, the, the, the corpses were in, were in ragged civilian clothing. Uh, there were so many bodies that the Americans really couldn't even count them. Uh, then moments later, after witnessing this kind of sobering scene that they really couldn't process yet, uh, the Americans came upon what looked to them like a small POW camp. And, uh, you know, at this point, you, you're looking at a kind of rectangular wooden, a series of rectangular wooden barracks inside this uh, wire enclosure, and then a parade ground that it looked like to them, uh, strewn with yet more bodies uh, that were incredibly emaciated, and many which had uh, bullet holes. Uh, the sights and smells of this strange and terrible place uh, staggered Cleary and the other soldiers, as, uh, as he's put it. There's nothing else that I can remember in my lifetime that remains as vivid and as horrible as that. And you just can't believe how bad this place was. It was the worst day of my whole life, and the memories are embedded in my brain. Uh, and I really think that that's emblematic. That's micro you know, a microcosm of so many others like him. Um, he and the others, of course, had discovered uh, what I would call hell on earth, and what I called hell before their very eyes in, in a book about this. And of course, they're going to be marked forever by their experiences. Um, and they're among the first of many, many, many thousands of American soldiers um, who are going to, to, uh, to follow along and, and uh, find other places similar to Ordruf as uh, April 1945 and May 1945 unfolds. Um, they were completely ignorant, for the most part that any such places existed. Uh, they could have never imagined that they would experience this firsthand. So today I would like to, to tell their story. Um, and the place to begin, I think, in understanding and processing this a little bit is uh, to sort of step back and look at this map and understand what's going on operationally in April 1945. And as a, as a military historian, uh, I do tend to look at it from that lens because that's, uh, that's their world at this moment. And that's why they are where they are. So what's happening at that point is obviously um, the Allies are dismembering Hitler's Germany. And, uh, you know, you have uh, the, these Allied armies that are just, uh, you know, plunging into the Reich from the east, the west, the south, the north, and whatever. Um, and so from the American point of view, you've got then a lot of, like, combined arms um, uh, units and task forces that are moving along Germany's very well-developed road net. Uh, so you've got infantry, armor, self-propelled artillery, engineers uh, coming along with them. And the whole idea is, you know, you're prepared in case you hit resistance, but you also have great mechanization with a lot of air cover uh, so that you can cover a lot of ground. And so really that's the focus is objective to objective of objective. And usually what happens is you go, you know, three to five miles and nothing's going on. And then smack, you run into one town and they decide to resist there. There's some holdouts or whatever, and then you run a resistance and then you're, you're in combat again. And their losses are still pretty high. Casualty rates in April 1945 for the US Army are almost equivalent to what we had suffered in Normandy the summer before. So there were still a lot of ways to get hurt and get killed at this point. And that would have been Cleary's focus and, and the guys who were part of his recon platoon and the untold tens of thousands of others. So um, in this context then, it's not surprising that 
um, that you know they don't really know what they're looking at. Um, and so I, I point to, out this day, April 4, 1945, that Orgeruf is the first camp uh, discovered in Germany by American soldiers. Uh, so it's background, just a little bit of the background. It's a small labor camp. Um, it's really small potatoes by the standards of the Third Reich and its, its genocide and its destruction of humanity. Um, it's, it's designed to house thousands of slave laborers who were building a massive headquarters complex for the German high command that was anticipated as being necessary for this, this sort of final uh, campaign in Germany. Uh, work had begun in the fall of 1944. Um, Orgerf is basically a subcamp of a much more famous camp to the east, Buchenwald. Uh, and of course, the whole subcamp thing will lead to a lot of uh, liberation confusion in the years to come, because uh, there's the main Buchenwald, and then there's all these like you know 80 some odd subcamps, and there's a lot of concentration camps in Germany like that. Uh, and of course, we're still identifying uh, various labor enclosures and camps and so on and so forth all these many decades later. So as of uh, the end of March 1945, there were about 10,000 inmates in uh, in Ordruf, uh, two thirds of whom were Jewish. The rest were Eastern Europeans, who were, of course, also in the Nazi crosshairs as so-called untermenschen, or subhumans, uh, and in many cases worked as slave laborers. What's, the, what's it like? Starvation, uh, not much food, crowded conditions, filthy, uh, and of course, this is just one relatively small, innocuous camp uh, among this vast Nazi uh, empire. Probably about average to below average, maybe, even in terms of severity among the many thousands. Um, the SS evacuates the camp. In, uh, on April 3rd, 1945, so there were very few prisoners left when the Americans got there the next day. Uh, but the few individuals you do encounter now as a GI were in terrible shape. And the American soldiers were absolutely shocked by their appearance. Their faces were so drawn out that when they tried to hold their hands up to us, it, uh, it was terrible. Private William Charbonneau, a 19-year-old infantry soldier, uh, and the 89th Division later said, and I'll, I'll give you these quotes because I think the, the actual GIs can tell you the story much better than I can. They were there. I wasn't. Um, they're drawn, many of these guys, to the site of, uh, of dozens of emaciated dead bodies strewn about the parade ground, as I mentioned, uh, but also packed into this wooden shed that they found. Uh, and as one soldier put it, uh, most of these corpses showed marks of brutality, bloody marks around the head, bruises on the back and kidneys, blackened testicles. Um, SS guards had apparently dusted uh, the, the corpses with lime in an attempt to, to mask the terrible stench of their decay. Uh, and of course, it only added to this acidic kind of uh, smell that, that hung over the area. Uh, many of the soldiers could never smell lime again without flashing back immediately to those terrible sights and smells, really, for the rest of their lives. Uh, they soon discovered much, much worse, unfortunately. The shed, as it turned out, was just this like little storage area uh, for the mass cremation and burial of many bodies about a kilometer outside the camp enclosure, where the SS had been trying to cover up what had happened there and how many people had uh, starved to death, worked to death, been, been killed or whatever. Army records estimate that there were about two to 3,000 bodies hastily buried outside uh, the Ordruf camp. Um, the task of, uh, of burning them uh, and cremating their remains, of course, is just beyond grisly. Uh, with the army so close, the SS had tried to do this in earnest and, and really quite hastily. They, they had dug a massive pit, built a makeshift grill of logs, uh, rails, timber, and then ordered the prisoners to pile as many bodies uh, as they could on this burning pit, almost like a surreal barbecue pit uh, for human bodies. And just to sort of give you a sense of what part of it looked like, you know, you can see here, it's just this detritus of, of burnt up wood and, and, and scorched uh, steel and whatnot. Um, the burnt and partially burnt remains of thousands of people were strewn about this pit and in the nearby ditches. Gray bone ash that was almost knee deep in the recollection of one soldier. It was still possible to distinguish a leg here, a head there, Sergeant Ralph Cray recalled. Whole area, you can imagine the smell. Stank of burnt wood, tree branches, scorched steel, gasoline fumes, and of course burning flesh and hair. Smell was so thick by the testimony of the, the GIs who were there, it was really almost hard to breathe. Farther away from the pyre, 
There were shallow trenches and ditches filled with the skeletal remains of so many others uh, who the SS apparently had not had time to burn. Mere skin and bones, their arms and legs were not thicker than broom handles, Captain Fred Diamond wrote in his diary. Their ribs protruded greatly, and their abdomens were hollow pits. So you're confronted with this as an American soldier. You have no idea this even exists. How, what, do you, what do you do? How, how do you react? Well, they're shocked. They're stunned. Many are morose. They're silent. They're angry, repulsed, sickened. Uh, many felt powerless and overwhelmed. Some of them wept. Some of them simply gawked. Uh, some prayed. Some raged. Um, none really understood uh, that there could be any base point for this kind of savagery. We thought we were hardened combat veterans, one later said. Some of us cried like babies. Some got sick. We couldn't believe what we were seeing. And in a way, that's why I wrote this book. As a combat-oriented historian, um, you know, I, I became aware and knew so many people who had had an experience similar to this, either liberating or witnessing a camp, um, and felt that, in a way, that stuck with them more than their combat experiences. And that this side of the Holocaust, I felt, hadn't quite uh, been covered maybe the way so many other aspects of it had. Um, and as a military historian, I felt maybe this was something, one thing that I could contribute to the conversation. And it, this quote alone, we thought we were hardened veterans, but you know, they weren't in this sense. No one could be. PSC Lad Roberts was 19 years old on the day of this liberation of Ordruf. Uh, he later opined that viewing the Ordruf Holocaust aged me 10 years in one day. I hope your teenager never has to see, smell, nor hear such a scene. And boy, I second that. Um, the local burgomaster, Albert Schneider, uh, who was technically a member of the Nazi party, and you'll, you'll find um, accounts that say he was a reasonably good guy, you'll find accounts that say he was awful and complicit in this. Uh, again, make of that what you will. But what does happen is that he and his wife, um, after this liberation and whatnot, uh, they commit suicide that night. And you'll often hear that they hang themselves, and I really think that's interesting because it's, it's not true. Um, but this was the military rumor. What's the most dishonorable death for a soldier? To be hanged. Okay? Instead, they, had, they cut their wrists. They slit their wrists. Why is, there, why is that interesting? Because the association in the minds of the soldiers, I think, was that this was the most horrible, dishonorable thing anybody could be associated with. So yes, they must have hanged themselves. Uh, so it's true they committed suicide, but not by hanging. And they left a note saying, sorry about the mess. You know, just, just surreal. Um, <laughs> So, the, you're looking here at, uh, at a visit by the, the top brass for the Allies. Um, Eisenhower, uh, let me point out, Eisenhower, Omar Bradley, you can see George Patton over here. I think this is Walton Walker, who's the 20th Corps commander over there. Okay, so American military authorities quickly descended on the camp once the news got around, once the 89th Division and the 4th Armored Division, which is also part of the mix. And again, you'll see that a lot, an armored unit and an infantry unit kind of working together in combined arms and, and having this kind of joint experience. So uh, on April 12th, so over a week later, Ike, Bradley, and Patton visit the camp and complete a tour, and part of which you're looking at here. Um, Eisenhower made a point of seeing every inch of that camp and the burial ground. Why? So that he could later bear personal witness and say, I saw this with my own eyes. Don't tell me this didn't happen. So in a way, Eisenhower is the first, I would argue, the first to anticipate the phenomenon of Holocaust denial. And it's one of the reasons why he's going to take steps pretty quickly beyond his own witnessing um, to, to try and document this as much as he can in as many forums as, as possible. So he later writes to uh, his boss, General George Marshall, the Army Chief of Staff back in DC, says the visual evidence and the verbal testimony of starvation, cruelty, and bestiality were so overpowering as to leave me a bit sick. Um, he would later, though, in life, talk about how he hadn't really gotten sick, but his, uh, his old friend or frenemy, George Patton, actually had. And I think Eisenhower sort of took pride in that way. You know, blood and guts, George Patton, he threw up there, and I didn't. You know? And so he made a point of even mentioning it in a 1964 interview he gave about this. Um, so they, they had that kind of interesting sort of push-pull relationship, and Patton fully admitted, yeah, I, I lost it there. You know, I mean, how could you not, in a way? So, um, yeah, so uh, Ike is then taking steps to, to document what happens. Of course, what's happening here is just only the beginning uh, of what's going to, to take place with so many other American soldiers as Germany is conquered. So the day before this visit, on April 11th, um, you'd had the, uh, the liberation of another major camp, one called Buchenwald. 
So in this instance, um, an advance column from the 9th Armored Infantry Battalion, 6th Armored Division, was moving east, of course, always east, um, approaching the town of Hoddlestedt. So that's about 30 miles northeast of Orgerf, um, closer to where the actual Buchenwald main camp is. Now, the um, 9th Armored Division guys, or 6th Armored Division guys, are, are uh, trailed by the 80th Infantry Division. Again, notice that pattern, infantry and armor kind of working together with this kind of recon element in front and, and whatever else. Um, so the armor soldiers encounter, uh, since they're in the lead, a, 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 a kind of lean, desperate-looking group of, of armed men in unique garb, uh, prison garb, what we would all recognize as, uh, you know, Holocaust garb in this day and age. But they don't know it at the time. They're like, what are these guys wearing? Who are these guys? Man, they look lean and desperate. Somehow they're armed. Who are they? What's going on with them? So all these things are going through your mind if you're one of these guys in the 9th Armored Infantry Battalion who are like, what are we encountering here? Uh, and how do we deal with this? And who are these guys? Well. They, they encounter the Americans and they tell them they'd have escaped from a nearby concentration camp called Buchenwald. Now, if you were really well versed as, a, as an American combat soldier, like reading newspaper a lot and had followed along in, in uh, world events, you know, in the late 1930s, you might have heard of the place, but the average guy, no idea. Like, what's that? Okay, so background on Buchenwald, of course, as many of you may know, it's established in 1937. Um, really, initially as a, as a center for uh, criminals, uh, but of course for the next year, once you have Kristallnacht, uh, the, the uh, pogrom and repression of, of many uh, German Jews, some of them are going to end up in Buchenwald. Uh, so it, it starts as this sort of uh, punishment center and, and incarceration and labor center. Uh, and of course, it grows as the war begins and you have more than political prisoners, more than, than all these other kind of folks. Um, so what happens over time um, is a prisoner hierarchy emerges in Buchenwald. And this is not unusual in many of the, 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 uh, the Nazi camps. Um, that, uh, that in a way, the SS outsources repression and terror and, uh, and discrimination and, uh, and thuggery and brutality and whatnot, sometimes to the prisoner population. And so what had happened initially at Buchenwald, um, it's German criminals, you know, murderers, rapists, kidnappers, you know, all that kind of stuff, uh, thieves that, that are sort of like the, 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 the power center that the SS is using to, to repress everybody else. Eventually, they are overtaken by German communists. Uh, who are very, very much of a mind to do much of the same thing as the common criminals, but are much better organized and have a political ideology behind what they're doing. So by the time of Liberation Day at Buchenwald, they are the power center among the prisoners. That's, in a way, who you're encountering as an American soldier, is some of the guys who've gotten their hands on weapons, and they are members of the Communist Party, some of them German communists, so they've got an advantage anyway, uh, linguistically and culturally, over people from Eastern Europe, and so you can kind of see how this goes. Um, and in a way, if we project forward, this will be, in Eastern Germany, the new oppressors uh, that, that, that Germans will now encounter. Uh, German communists who set up the, the German Democratic Republic and all that business too. So in a way it's a precursor to that. But you don't know that as an American soldier. What you know is you've encountered this, this camp enclosure that has 112,000 miserable souls in it. And it's designed for, oh, I don't know, maybe a third of that number. You've got the established camp that had been built since 1937 by prisoner labor. Uh, which there's some semblance of infrastructure, and then you have this sort of veritable dumping ground called the Little Camp that had been used in these last months of the war as uh, the Germans were evacuating people from, from uh, Eastern Europe where they were retreating, uh, moving people back into Germany in these camp enclosures that just get worse and worse and worse because the conditions are horrible. Uh, so the Little Camp is physically separated from the rest of Buchenwald, uh, by barbed wire and armed guards, and as I mentioned, it's a dumping ground for transient and hated people, uh, especially Jews, Jewish survivors who have made it this far, generally coming from Eastern Europe. They're living in tents, barns, a stable. There's one latrine in, in the entire little camp. Uh, you can imagine how terrible the conditions are. You're getting maybe 500 calories per day. Uh, there's dead bodies everywhere. It's horrid beyond description, um, and so, the American soldiers are encountering this. This is the front gate of the main camp uh, where you've had this communist uprising and so leader, later leading to a lot of communist propaganda about how well, we liberated ourselves at Buchenwald. We didn't need the US Army, the capitalists from the West and all this kind of stuff. It's, it's really kind of nonsense because the uprising is gonna happen if the US Army is not right next door. 
Okay? That's why it happens when it does. But to give them credit, uh, that took guts, too, to rise up against the SS guards, many of whom are you know, either not sure whether they're going to stay, whether they're going to flee, you know, all this kind of stuff is going on. So as an American, though, now you're in the middle of a really kind of tough, t touchy situation uh, dealing with the survivors. You're stunned at the sight of the place, the emaciated survivors, especially, of course, the main compound isn't good. <laughs> I don't want to paint a picture that's incorrect. It's bad. Uh, but it's nothing compared to the little camp, where you are seeing the absolute worst of, of human treatment of human. Um, and you don't know how to process it. The stench is suffocating. A trip through the little camp is like a nightmare, one American soldier wrote. The smell of death is thick in the air. Staff Sergeant Martin uh, Dick Rennie was a member of Able Company, 317th Infantry, 80th Infantry Division. He's one of the first uh, soldiers into the camp alongside his armored colleagues. Um, and he interacts with the survivors and describes them as, quote, completely devoid of energy and motion. They really hadn't the will to do anything. These people were horrifyingly thin, emaciated skeletons covered with skin. And he struggled to keep from completely breaking down and sobbing. Um, as he later put it, I was ashamed of the whole human race. Really powerful statement, I think. Um, and you, you see this pattern, by the way, too, because if you're, if you're an armored guy, if you're a tanker, there's only so far you can get in the middle of this. You've got your tank. You're probably not taking your tank inside a camp or whatever. Maybe you dismount and you move around the camp a while, and then you kind of got to move on. The infantry then has to kind of have this larger presence uh, on the ground in a lot of these camps and, and deal with people often more one-on-one. -on -one. It's the pattern, at least. Not always, but it's something of the pattern. Um, of course, as the GIs explored the camp, uh, they saw more dead bodies. They saw the barracks. They saw the, quote, incineration plant, which is a, uh, an oven or crematorium. There were no gas chambers at, uh, at Buchenwald, just a, a crematorium. Um, and, you know, just more unfathomable sights. And again, I apologize for this image. It's not pleasant, but this is what they saw. Um, revolted. They were shocked, discouraged, angered, horrified. And especially as they began to interact with the survivors, many of whom were weeping, joyous, really half dead. Um, Sergeant Edward Swick's experiences, I think, were sort of reasonably representative of the larger whole. Uh, though as a Jewish American, uh, his emotions probably ran even deeper than, than most of his buddies. Tears ran down his cheeks as the former inmates descended on him. They closed in around me. Arms came out from everywhere to touch my uniform, my face. Several grabbed my hands and began kissing them. One man clung desperately to Swick's leg. The sergeant felt, quote, overwhelmed by the enormity of the horror that I was witnessing. Well, one of the things that's killing the prisoners is not just starvation, but dehydration. You know, you can go longer without eating than without being hydrated. And so people were dying of dehydration, or many of the survivors were really thirsty, as you could imagine, by this time. So uh, one of them asked Swick for a drink of water. So he's got his canteen on his cartridge belt. Uh, he hands the man his canteen. The guy takes a long pull. Uh, you know, he's really thirsty, um, and then he just doubles over and begins to retch. And when that happens, there's alarm cries from all of the, the fellow liberated prisoners around Swick. They're like, oh my God, he poisoned him. He poisoned him. This, this soldier has poisoned our guy here. And it's, that's the mindset. Because they've been so horribly mistreated, they couldn't trust anybody. And they're like, okay, there's an American soldier. We think he's a friend, but look what just happened. So the first default setting was he must have poisoned him. This was incredibly traumatizing to Swick because he's trying to say, no, no, I didn't. The guy just took too long of a pull. His system couldn't handle that. Um, he's like, I come in peace. I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm a friend. I'm an American soldier. I'm an American soldier. I'm a Jew. He kept telling him that. I am Jewish. I'm not here to harm you. And it was a tough sell. So imagine that. You know, that kind of dynamic that's going on here, and it's something he never forgot that was incredibly upsetting to him. Um, later, as he explored the detritus and filth of the little camp, um, a man showed him the unimaginable horror of the latrine there. And I apologize, this is so horrible. But this is, again, what they saw. He was so overcome by the smell that he buried uh, his nose into the crook of his arm. And there was worse. He looked inside and saw that, quote, at the top of that nearly filled pit, of human waste lay an almost submerged rotting body of a man. The poor soul must have lost his balance, fallen off the two encrusted boards that served as the seat. In that cesspool of human filth, he lost his fight for breath and either suffocated or drowned, just in human filth. This is what Swick saw 
and could never, ever, ever get out of his mind again. He fled the little camp, only to come upon the crematorium, which is right next door to these bodies you're looking at here. Uh, and he found incinerated ashes of dead prisoners uh, heaped in a pile. Another soldier uh, took what looked like a chicken bone from the pile and handed it to Swick. Uh, and the young sergeant takes this and he's like, oh my gosh, this is part of somebody's body. And he looks at the pile and he wonders, how many people who are in there, sons, brothers, fathers, whatever, that, that are gone forever, how many people does that represent? And all he could do is he's just screaming to himself, why? <laughs> That's the question we keep asking to this day, isn't it? And it occurs to him right at that spot. You know, so pr terrifically upsetting. So soon a very tragic situation occurred that's going to be repeated many times in multiple camps that spring. Uh, not just a book involved, but pretty much everywhere the American soldiers are liberating or later witnessing. Um, in their generosity and their ignorance, because remember, they haven't been prepared for this, they haven't been trained for it, they don't know what's in front, it just happens like that. Um, their eagerness to help the survivors, the Americans... Um, sometimes, almost in a way, kill them with kindness. What I mean is, you're dealing with really hungry people. Um, Americans are, are really the best fed people on the planet in 1945. And you as a soldier would have complained to the high heavens about your rations, your C rations, your K rations. You're an American after all. You, you love complaining about things and about food and how it ought to be better and everybody knows their mess sergeant stinks and all that kind of stuff, right? But, you know, <laughs> you're in a great spot compared to the folks who are in front of you. So they're hungry, feed them, right? Not so easy, is it? When someone's 70 pounds underweight, uh, they can't eat your hypercaloric uh, K rations. If they do, uh, it could kill them. Um, and at a minimum, it's gonna cause serious uh, you know, gastrointestinal distress and whatnot. And so when you don't know this and you're being generous, oh, here's food, here's this, that, and the other thing, and of course, if you're that hungry, you're eating anything you get your hands on, right? Um, you, you have a potentially tragic situation that sometimes leads to deaths and, and, of course, as I said, more commonly, just real distress, physical distress. You don't know how to help people in that sense. There's also a profound guilt um, that sets in among many of the American soldiers for some, like, why didn't we get here sooner, you know, but uh, more commonly, it's like, I'm sorry, I'm repulsed by you. I, I don't want physical contact with you. You don't look human to me. So there's a kind of dehumanization in your mind, at least. Like, oh my God, you look like a skeleton. You, you probably have lice and other vermin, and I, I don't want you touching me. So, and yet at the same time, you appreciate this person's joy and, and maybe to help them. But you know, that the guilt is in what your thoughts were, not your behavior. The behavior is usually very correct, very good, uh, but that in your mind. The larger guilt, and really more serious, is in um, how you have to behave toward them in this sense. Imagine if you're one of the survivors and you've gotten through this horrible ordeal. What's the first thing you want to do besides eat uh, or drink something? You want to go home. Of course, you want to go and see if any of your family is left. You want to go back to wherever you came from. And you want to do it as soon as you could. You've maybe been dreaming about that for months or years. Uh, I'm sorry, as an American soldier, I can't let you do that. If you're out there roaming around on your own, your life is much more in peril than here, where I can help you along with medical care and good food and stability, and we can then deal with all the other stuff later. Uh, but also, too, there's the reprisal thing. Very possible if you're out there roaming around, there's going to be reprisals on German civilians. And we don't want that either. And we don't want you raiding food warehouses and eating too much. And all, so you have to regulate them. In a way, you've got to incarcerate them now. So in a way, think of that moment when that joy of the, liberate, the person liberated now looks at you with those eyes, like, I can't believe you're doing this to me. You know, so a lot of American soldiers have a really rough time with that for the rest of their lives. In addition to those who overfed people who died, and then they have the sort of that, that on their conscience. So um, there, was, there was a guy, you know, who gave out sea, that, that Swick saw, who, the guy who gave out sea rations, somebody devoured them and like just died on the spot. So that poor soldier, you know, had to live with that the rest of his life, feeling, oh my God, I killed that person. When in a way he really didn't, but you can see that's, that's the problem of this whole horrible situation. So, um, medics. Well, in the wake of the liberation, uh, you know, you've got Americans all over Germany beginning to realize the immensity of this Nazi repression. 
and they've got a real humanitarian crisis on their hands. So before vacating Buchenwald, the SS had cut off the water supply, and that really leads to serious problems, as you might imagine. Um, you've got a dire uh, sanitation situation. Tens of thousands of hungry, filthy, dehydrated people, some of them half dead, uh, now living in primitive squalor. Uh, the engineers generally get the, the job to clean up the mess, the infrastructure mess, get the water running again, clean up the sewage, clean up the, the detritus and the filth, clean out the barracks, uh, get the living conditions better. So as an engineer, that's what you would have dealt with. The medics, of course, have to deal with the human condition. You know, of trying to help people who are really near death and who really don't trust you. So the medics, I would argue, maybe have the most difficult job. Uh, the, the infantry, the armor, they tend to move on to their next mission. You know, uh, it's the medics who then have to stay and the engineers and clean it all up. At Buchenwald, that's the 120th evacuation hospital. And they've been trained, of course, to save healthy young men uh, from combat wounds. Instead, now you find yourself caring uh, for people whose conditions is arguably unprecedented in human history, arguably. Uh, the survivors of the little camp are, of course, in the, in the worst shape of all. Uh, so the, the medics will then disinfect the former SS barracks, uh, turn it into a makeshift hospital, begin caring for many thousands of patients, uh, many of whom had to be hauled from labor laboriously from all over the compound. Um, they're assisted by liberated inmates who were in good enough shape to help them, including many doctors. Um, who are now going to, to, to practice and help, um, help uh, save lives. So according to the 120th records, they treated 5,490 patients with 51 deaths in a six-day period. Uh, pretty good rate of survival, but, I, but I'll bet there were probably dozens of others throughout the camp who, who never see medical care and die you know, without the medics uh, getting to them. Um, soldiers de patients, fed them, sometimes intravenously. They cleaned them, they spoke to them, they nurtured them. Uh, they battered multiple diseases. You can imagine what a disease petri dish uh, place like this is. Typhus is a real problem. Dysentery, tuberculosis. Um, you know, they, they pretended they were not nauseated by the stench, but of course they were. The job was round the clock, requiring total dedication. The sight of those near death was beyond belief. Private Hens Hill, an orderly, wrote to his wife. Thighs the size of my arm, buttocks no longer visible, pelvic bones seen at any angle as were other human bones, and you can imagine the odor. After so many months of mistreatment, um, a lot of the patients had to learn to trust again. You know, the trust that there actually were good people who actually wanted to help you in a disinterested, professional, and kind way. The mental disturbance of the inmates was very apparent, uh, one doctor uh, recalled, it took anywhere from a week to three weeks for most of the inmates to realize the significance of the fact that they were now among friends and Americans who had liberated the camp. They were happy to see us, but at first they distrusted everyone. Again, you can understand why. So you'd have to earn their trust in that sense. Of course, the most famous survivor uh, of Buchenwald and of the little camp is Elie Wiesel, you know, a Nobel Prize uh, recipient. Uh, and he later talked about the, the liberators. He said, they gave us back our lives. What I felt for them then nourishes me to the end of my days, and will do so. We became not only comrades, not only brothers, we became each other's witnesses. So true. He's one, you know, incredibly effective witness. So, um, what about telling the world about the, the camp and whatnot? Well, the medics are working to save the lives. Uh, if that happens, media and governmental delegations begin descending on Buchenwald uh, at Ike's behest and they begin to build international awareness of the Nazi concentration camps. So you have a parliamentary delegation, you have a congressional delegation um, that, that tours the camp on April 24th, 1945. So about two weeks after liberation, when it was cleaned up somewhat, but still not that great. Uh, so they're forever gonna document what had happened there. And I think that's really sort of the, the effectiveness of Eisenhower, that he, he, he puts those wheels in motion immediately. Um, and quite effectively. The memory of what we saw and heard will haunt us ineffaceably for many years, the parliamentary report commented, I think, in chilling brevity. The congressional, congressional report said with cryptic sadness, pictures and descriptions of the conditions of this camp cannot adequately portray what we saw there. So true, words are inadequate. There were media delegations, including 18 prominent journalists, uh, mostly newspaper folks, headed by uh, Joseph Pulitzer um, that, that visit in the, in the wake of this. Um, and one example is a New York Times headline written by Julius Adler that said, Buchenwald worse than battlefield. 
That stands out to me too, you know. Um, the most famous reporting is eventually done by uh, one of the leading broadcast journalists at the time, uh, CBS's Edward R. Murrow, uh, who, by the way, knew uh, from pre-war, he knew some of the survivors he encountered. So this, in a way, was personal to Murrow. Um, he put, he said uh, <laughs> to his listeners, he was nearly overcome by what he saw. He says, he warns them, it will not be pleasant listening. And he says, the stink was beyond all description. There were two rows of bodies. They were thin and very white. Some of the bodies were terribly bruised, though there seemed to be little flesh to the bruise. Some had been shot through the head, but they bled out little. And he concluded his broadcast. He said, I pray you to believe what I have said happened about Buchenwald. I have reported out what I saw and heard, but only part of it. For most of it, I have no words, says the man who's more eloquent with words than arguably about anybody on the planet. So the, the sort of capstone to this whole thing uh, happens uh, a little bit later in southern Germany in Bavaria at a, uh, at a concentration camp called Dachau, which was, uh, you know, one of the originals. Okay, so when do the Americans get there? April 29, 1945, so a couple of weeks after the whole Buchenwald drama has happened. Um, so two U.S. divisions, the 42nd and 45th Infantry Divisions, with an assist from the 20th Armored Division, are going to converge on this place, uh, which, of course, is located in, in the sort of the northern reaches of Munich, uh, it's its own town, uh, Dachau is, but uh, it's, it's kind of a suburb by, by this era, too. Um, so what you're looking at here is the, the, the aerial view um, of, uh, of Dachau. And, uh, you know, when was it founded? March uh, 23rd, 22nd, 1933. Originally for political prisoners, once Hitler takes power, he starts to round up uh, socialists and communists primarily, who were his key opposition. And, uh, and puts them in, in this camp, another one near Berlin. And uh, originally, Dachau, not that it's great, but it's guarded by the local police. Um, and so, you know, as time goes on, you would have looked at that as a prisoner as, as fondly, because eventually the SS is gonna come in and run this place, and then things get, of course, immeasurably worse. So Dachau is a, um, you know, a punishment center, a labor camp, a concentration camp, as we call it, um, but it's also an administrative center for the SS. It's a training center. So most of the prisoners are over here in what is euphemistically and chillingly called by the Nazis protective custody compound or enclosure. You're in protective custody here. Um, out here are, uh, these are, uh, you know, dwellings for SS officers and other SS guards. Um, there are workshops sort of in here. There's an administrative center, there's a, there's a firing range, there's a training center, and so Dachau will often be described by Holocaust scholars as a, quote, model camp, but I think we have to sort of step back and qualify the phrase. When we hear model student, for instance, we're referring to something good, aren't we? We want all our students to be like this. What they mean by model camp is many others will be created along the same lines as Dachau for the same kind of horror, okay? So Dachau is influential in that sense. Um, but it's not designed, of course, to, to hold a lot of people, as you can tell just from one glance there. It has about 100 plus subcamps that we know of um, around you know, this general area. Um, by Liberation Day, there were about 40,000 miserable souls packed in this so-called protective custody compound. Um, who were they? Mostly Eastern Europeans, but a minority of, of Jewish people, too. Uh, so it's a mix, but primarily Eastern European slaves. Almost none of the approaching American soldiers, even generals and colonels, knew the true nature of Dachau. For most, it's just another day in combat. Among those who were cognizant of the objective, they thought of it as a POW camp that they were going to liberate. That there must be some sort of POWs there or something like that, as you would have thought of it. Well, this is your first sight as you get close to it as an American soldier, the so-called and infamous death train. So you're looking at a, a line of boxcars here uh, that's you know, just outside, I think, the, the southern part of the camp. And you're looking at hundreds upon hundreds of bodies here, either in the boxcars or nearby, strewn on the ground, half in, half out, I mean, whatever. It's 39 of these train cars. And so, again, what's your reaction? Shock, revulsion, anger, nausea. It was all I could do to believe it, Lieutenant Colonel Don Downard, one of the battalion commanders, uh, later said. So Americans, you know, are just seeing this, and it's hard to process that. They don't know anything about the terrible odyssey of these victims who have ended up here in this uh, death train. 
Um, it originated at Weimar on April 7th, so right about after Ordruf is liberated, right before Buchenwald, when the, the SS is just moving people around, you know, from, away from the approaching Allied armies and trying to dodge Allied planes because they're strafing anything they can on the railroads. I mean, it's just a mess. And so they're moving them south where the Germans are still in control, and it is just a, a horrendous nightmare. Uh, there's allegedly 4,500 people who start this journey. Little food, little water, chaotic situation. Uh, some are executed by their, their SS guards at one point, but the majority of the, are dead from mistreatment, just general mistreatment. Most of them are at the end of their tether anyway, and you know this kind of mistreatment, that's the last that their, their systems can take. Um, so according to the records I found, at least, um, you know, the, the death train gets to the Dachau area about April 27th. And there are about 800 or so survivors who are, who are left here and then are herded into the, into the camp, who then become part of the, the protective custody compound, and you know, they're, they're in the mix when you're liberating that. The 42nd Division uh, also sees it, so it's 42nd and 45th, uh, that converges on this place uh, almost at the same time. They'll bicker and argue for years about who's first and all that. I'm sorry, to me, that's quite pointless. Uh, what matters is they're both there. They're both really important to this whole story, as is the 20th Armored. And from the prisoner's point of view, do they really care? <laughs> they care which unit has the honors or whatever? I mean, no, they care that they've been liberated by people who are gonna help them. That's what matters. So the side of the death train victims, of course, deeply upsetting to a lot of these GIs. The bodies were lying, hanging out the open door, Sergeant Jack Hollowell said. Some people have been able to get out and then fallen in the field and died. They were just little skeletons within their prison clothing. One veteran infantryman turned to a buddy and he said, I've been in the Army 39 months. I've been overseas in combat for 23. I'd gladly go through it all again if I knew things like this would be stopped. Very powerful statement, in my opinion. That's a long time in uniform and a long time in combat. That's, that's two years uh, of more or less frontline combat, in which every day can seem like a year. You know? So that's a big statement. Um, no one was more upset than Lieutenant William Walsh, uh, the commander of... Uh, uh, I Company, 157th Infantry, 45th Division. Uh, Walsh had no idea, you know, like everybody else, that this could even be possible that such things happened. And all he could think about was the families of the victims. Do they know they're here? Do they, you know, what, what's up with that? And of course, what he couldn't conceive of probably is that most of their families were probably dead in camps in the East, you know, had been killed long before this. Their fathers, their mothers, their sisters, their brothers, their children don't know they're here, he said in an interview years later. Nobody will ever know what happened to them. And the more he thought about it, of course, the more it really upset him, as it would anybody. So a dark mood set in among Walsh and many others. Some of them were sobbing, some were raging. The effect of it just opened up a flood of raw emotions, Walsh's boss, Lieutenant Colonel Felix Sparks, uh, later said. Some were screaming, some were cursing, some were silent. In fact, Walsh himself was so upset that he broke down and completely lost control of himself. So he's a company commander, he's the leader, he's authority. Uh, and that's the challenge of military leadership. You don't have the luxury of that emotion because all of your soldiers are looking to you, uh, you know, <laughs> for life and death quite often, but in this case for proper comportment and what to do next. What do we do now, Lieutenant? And if your answer is, I've completely lost my mind, and you go do anything you want, and if you find German guards, you can execute them with impunity, you can see how that could be uh, kind of spread like a virus in a way among the soldiers, like, okay, I guess that's how we're operating here. I guess that's what we're doing. So Walsh, as a leader, uh, even though it's really tough to imagine this, doesn't have that luxury of really thinking about the humanity. Uh, so when he loses it, it creates then a tense environment in which reprisals could happen. Uh, he himself executes a, uh, a German POW, a guy they, they take prisoner near the death train. Uh, one of his soldiers executes another guy. Uh, but the most infamous part of this whole thing and, and the deadliest part of it happens here in a nearby coal yard uh, where some of the, the German POWs who are taken as the, the, uh, the units go through the, the whole compound here are collected near this wall. This is a hospital right next door. Some of these guys have been in the hospital. They're just like German military who are in this hospital and they've been cleared out by the Americans and, and put into this coal yard here. Um, and of course, what happens is that uh, um, when the Americans are facing them, it's very tense. Uh, and this, this soldier, uh, Martin Curtin, a machine gunner, he and others open fire. Uh, this is John Lee. He's a Browning automatic rifleman. He opens fire, Walsh, 
so on and so forth. And so um, Sparks, Lieutenant Colonel Sparks is nearby. He hears the shooting. He comes in. He kicks Curtin off the machine gun. He tells him to cease fire. He fires his pistol in the air to get the attention of anybody who doesn't hear him. He tries to put a stop to this. But you can see the damage is done, uh, that you've had reprisal executions in this coal yard. Um, anywhere between 20 to 25 were killed, maybe. It's very hard to determine this. Okay? I'm only giving you a guesstimate. A like number wounded. Estimates vary. Later on, there was a 7th Army Inspector General report. These units were under the, the command of the 7th the Army, under uh, uh, General Alexander Patch. And eventually, Wade Hazlip, who succeeds Patch, who was, by the way, Patch was just uh, almost a victim of combat fatigue himself uh, and, and was rotated home, even though he'd been an incredibly successful commander. He'd had a very, very difficult situation in which his son was killed uh, in, in the fall of 1944, and Patch was not in good health. So Wade Hazlip, who had been a corps commander, takes over for Patch. He's the one who's going to send the inspector general there and deal with this whole thing administratively. Um, and there's a real worry. Because Eisenhower is concerned at the, at the higher level, the theater level, he's concerned that these killings will derail the Allies' legal justification to punish German war criminals and the perpetrators of what we call the Holocaust. He's really concerned. Now, fortunately, this doesn't happen. But remember, they're living in the moment. They don't know how it all turns out. They don't know there's going to be Nuremberg trials and all that kind of stuff. They just know we got a situation on our hands here. So um, now. Latter year posterity, at least from my research, I, I think my perception is it, it tends to exonerate the troops because of the circumstances. And, you know, of course, I, I, think I, t I find that totally understandable in that sense that, you know, none of us really was there in this environment to know what it looked like, it smelled like, and how stunning and shocking and horrible this was. It's all true. And what we might do ourselves in that circumstance, right? So I think we have to have a lot of empathy in that sense, too, but also, this is an army that's supposed to be fighting under a cloak of legality. That is then going to enforce uh, international law, right, against uh, war criminals. So it should be following the same standards. So this is only my opinion, and to take it for whatever you, you will. Um, the, the, the problem here is not necessarily the shock, the anger, the revulsion. I've chronicled that to you today in other situations, right? And there's many, many, many others as Americans are liberating camps that spring. The difference in this moment is leadership. That when Walsh loses it, his men lose it. And this, uh, there is no other recorded instance in the liberation of the camps in which you have this kind of thing happen to this kind of scale. That's the difference. And Sparks' role in the whole thing is that he doesn't remove, doesn't either understand or know or whatever, or fails to remove Walsh from the situation and get it under control before this can happen. Uh, again, really easy to judge decades later. We all know that. But perhaps that's something of what history is for, too. But only my, only my opinion. Um, and, and I'd invite you to, to develop your own opinion, and maybe you have. Uh, but that's, that's just as I see it. Um, what are the others seeing as they get deeper into the camp? Well, same old story, right? Uh, more bodies, uh, more horror. Um, it's almost exactly like Book involved, just larger and in an urban setting. Uh, one notable exception, Dachau did have a gas chamber that we don't know 100% if it was ever used. Uh, the, the body of scholarly opinion is it probably was, but I can't tell you that as a 100% fact, but we do know it was there. Um, and you can see uh, the body stacked for burial here. Uh, and of course, many barracks, you know, crowded with sick, emaciated, half-dead prisoners, disease-ridden, mobbing the soldiers, same old story there. Uh, the stench of the compound overwhelming. Uh, some Americans so overwhelmed by the smell that they vomited or fled. Others actually donned gas masks, believe it or not. Uh, most of them just kind of wandered around. Um, here are a couple of quotes that I think tell you the larger whole. It was a day when our young men cried and gagged and vomited, Sergeant Hank Desjarnet said. Another soldier, PFC Clifford Barrett, later wrote, uh, and I think this is really poignant, everywhere were sights fill which filled us with horror. Human beings in the shape of walking skeletons were dropping dead at our feet. The dying were on the ground looking at us, and you wondered if, you, if they knew they were now free. Um, contrast between the, the uh, you know, young, well-fed, healthy American uh, soldiers and, and many of these prisoners, although in this picture, the, a lot of these guys are in better shape than many of the others you would have encountered. Uh, the contrast was profound. The aftermath of the liberation, really similar to Buchenwald, same pattern. 
Um, engineers, or excuse me, infantry and armor tend to move on to the next mission. Engineers come in and clean up the mess. Um, civil affairs people come in to figure out what to do with the survivors. Um, and then, of course, the, the medics come in to, to, uh, to deal with uh, all of these folks who need medical care so badly. In this case, you have two primary units, the 116th, the 127th evacuation hospitals. Uh, they do most of that grisly medical work. You'll have some portable surgical hospitals, too, that are on site, but the 116th and the 127th do most of the heavy lifting. Um, there were 9,435 admissions to these hospitals with about 1,600 deaths, uh, a 17% uh, mortality rate. So pretty good under the circumstances in that sense, though probably many, many others died in the compound before you could get to them. Um, almost to the man or woman, because remember, in the medical units, there are female nurses that are part of this. Initially, by the way, this tells you about, something about gender, uh, sort of gender roles and, and, uh, and realities of the time. Initially, when the 120th got to book involved, um, the, the commanders were saying, no, get our female nurses out of here. I don't want them seeing this. You know? uh, and eventually, the nurses are like, we can help. We need to be there. And they, they win that argument, fortunately. But it tells you something about 1945 America in that sense. So in this case, you don't have that drama going on. Instead, everybody who can help is there. Um, so yeah, I mean, all of them remember this very profoundly for the rest of their lives. In the short term, uh, the camps gave meaning and definition to the war they had fought. Up until then, we not about, might not have been clear what we were fighting for, uh, one infantryman said. But after that, we damn well knew what we were fighting against. Um, in spite of that sense of purpose, there wasn't much uplifting, positive or redeeming about this experience of liberating or witnessing the camps. For them, it's disturbing, traumatic, which they glimpsed humanity at its lowest, its most depraved, its most savage, and most were left with this boundless, permanent sense of tragedy and loss, along with that profound sense of guilt that I had outlined earlier. Some forever held a grudge against Germans, some lost faith in humanity or in God, uh, most could never quite come to terms with how human beings could behave with this kind of calculated, cruel brutality towards other human beings, and how a supposedly loving or even vengeful God could ever allow it. Now, there's a lot of theological soul searching here, you know, uh, especially among the, uh, the victims of the Holocaust, right? Um, I can never really describe what Dachau took from me, one liberator said. It was about seven years I had to keep my weapons out of my reach. And that is serious trauma there. Some were strengthened by the experience. No matter how difficult their post-war lives, they knew they could now handle anything. It made some people more tolerant of others, uh, of other races, other cultures, uh, other ideas. Uh, some became uh, heavily involved in the post-war civil rights movement in this country, because really, we had a racial apartheid system in this country, there were much of it, uh, at the same time this is happening. You know, and so that's certainly an eye-opener for, for many Americans. Uh, in the immediate decades after the war, few were willing to talk about it. Um, that's very, very common, you know, and certainly there would have been a lot of trauma there. Many of those that did talk about what they'd seen uh, didn't get the reaction they wanted. Disbelief, coldness. Oh, don't, why do we want to hear about that? One man uh, had taken a lot of snapshots uh, at a camp that he helped liberate. And uh, he found out one day, a couple decades later, his wife had destroyed the photos. It was devastating to him. But to his wife's thinking, he was like, I don't want that in my house, that kind of ugliness. And I don't want my children stumbling into that. So you can kind of understand her perspective that she should have checked with him. It, it, it created a rift between them, as you might imagine. Um, over time, of course, as they aged, and when they became aware of Holocaust denial, which was profoundly disturbing to them, imagine if you'd been there and seen this, and then you have people coming along later saying, this didn't happen, or it wasn't so bad, or all this other rot. Um, many of them are now, you know, once they got older, were saying, oh my gosh, I don't have the luxury anymore of not talking about this. Someday I will be gone. You know, and so I need to leave behind this testimony. As one of them put it, he said, we are apply." He, he said, I now realize it's my responsibility to discuss my experience to whomever and whenever. This was about 55 years later, this particular liberator. He said, we are obliged to prevent a repeat of this tragedy. Uh, Felix Sparks, the battalion commander uh, who helped liberate uh, Dachau uh, and eventually put a stop to some of the reprisal killings, um, he, would, he spoke about his experiences at Dachau for the rest of his life uh, to school kids, anywhere he could, anybody who would listen. 
He, he wrote to them. He, he would speak to them. He said, I've told them this is not an isolated incident. Don't think there's an incident that's behind us. This is something that can happen at any time. I think that's a really good lesson uh, for why we study the Holocaust and why you should always study this kind of thing. Uh, for those of us in the, in the 21st century then, the mission of documenting and understanding the Holocaust, including the liberation experience, uh, I would argue is as important as ever. Uh, just uh, not that long ago, a few years ago, an Anti-Defamation uh, League Worldwide Opinion Survey of 50,000 uh, adults in 103 countries revealed that 26% of respondents admitted to deeply held anti-Semitic attitudes. Uh, and I dare say that has not abated, has it? Um, it? It certainly hasn't, and it's perhaps gotten only worse. 54% had never even heard of the Holocaust. Um, you know, mainly in Middle Eastern countries or in Asia, you know, they never heard of this. How are they going to know then, right? Um, and, you know, <laughs> two thirds had either never heard of it or believed it had never really happened. So I'd argue there's much more to do. Uh, so most of those Americans, if not almost all, who liberated or witnessed these terrible places and had this experience, um, and who I've discussed just in a kind of microcosm, most of them are gone now. Uh, so I'll conclude today by doing something I rarely do, just reading you a passage from, from my book that I hope maybe expresses the larger theme we've been exploring today. They were ordinary people who found themselves enmeshed in extraordinary circumstances of a sort they could never have imagined. Their goal is to survive war and then go home. They were stunningly ignorant of Nazi atrocities and allied war aims. They saw death of the worst sort, starvation and deterioration caught, caused by contagious disease, burned flesh and bones, caked in industrial ovens, the remnants of gray bones and sediment, and gaping wounds of violent murder. They smelled death's nauseating byproducts of rot and putrefaction. They inspected mechanisms of torture and repression. They cared for the survivors in ways both guided and misguided. They nursed them back to health, restoring their dignity and their very lives. They occasionally behaved with indiscipline, but far more frequently with sympathetic soldierly correctness. The liberation experience forever affected them in ways too numerous to count. And in the cycle of time that inevitably consumes all generations, their experience should mark us too and those who succeed us forevermore. Thank you. Well, yeah, so the question is, um, like, Hamas's perpetrations of the, on October 7th of this year, are those war crimes or not? Now, I am no legal scholar, so um, I, I will tell you, of course, I consider much of what they did war crimes, uh, unless we're talking about attacks on, I guess, Israeli military targets, which, at the end, a state of war didn't exist either, you know, I guess, legally. But, um, but yes, of course, I, I would consider that. But, but in a way, what do I know? I'm not necessarily a real legal scholar, but I think we also have a... Uh, uh, I mean, maybe a moral barometer on some levels that, we, that maybe we know what's right and wrong. And, uh, and I think uh, it's certainly not right to, to kidnap people, to, uh, to, to, kill pe to kill civilians and all these kinds of things. I mean, absolutely. Horrifying. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. Is this working? Yes. Mm -hmm. um, um, my father, as I've told you, uh, was one of the liberators of Dachau, I believe he was there maybe the second day after it had first been opened, and he was fluent in Yiddish, that was his native language, and his job was to interview the survivors and talk to them about what happened, could they identify particular people as perpetrators, and the prisoners gave them many names, and so they went into the surrounding countryside, everyone interviewed claim no knowledge whatsoever of anything going on. And 
they took certain prisoners with them the next day to identify people because they would know. And um, of course they identified many people, and, but they had to work very hard to stop the prisoners from attacking the German people there who were denying anything. That was part, when you said reprisals, that was word my father used also. He, they were trying to stop it to make sure, you know, if these people could be held responsible. But everything you said were part of my father's experience, and especially his, he lost all faith in humanity okay. at yeah. that point. So, yeah, I, anyways. I appreciate you sharing that with us. Yeah, it, you know, along the lines of reprisals, there's a, there's a story I, I didn't tell uh, that, that very applies to, to what you're saying, to, to the dilemma your father probably faced. Um, because the dynamic in a lot of these camps, I know for sure at Buchenwald, but, but in many of these camps, is okay, you know, the, the prisoners want to get at the people who have just oppressed them. And, and, and uh, you know, sometimes that's their fellow prisoners, the, the infamous capos or whatever. Remember I said the SS sort of outsources terror and repression. So there's that, but also, you know, guards who have been tracked down. And so now you have a major moral dilemma on your hands as a U.S. soldier. You are establishing a bond, in a way, with the people you have just liberated. What do they want to do? They want to kill their oppressors, which you can totally understand, maybe not like they understand it, but we could all understand that, that concept of revenge on the spot. Sometimes they ask to borrow your rifle to do that. Do you give up your rifle? You're never supposed to do that as a soldier, obviously. Um, but some do, here and there. Uh, or some look the other way. But imagine that moral dilemma, because that's probably not right either, is it? Um, so you may have to step in and say, I'm sorry, I can't let you do that. I am going to protect the life of this horrible human being who just you know, persecuted you for who knows how long. Imagine how difficult that's going to be in terms of the guilt and all those other things too. Yeah, yeah. And a lot of times that's the problem with, with uh, prisoners as time goes forward when they're interacting with uh, German locals who are put to work burying bodies or cleaning up or whatever, you can imagine how tense that could be too. Yeah, great point. Just thinking about the fact that I studied a lot about the Holocaust and have taught it over time. Uh, but this perspective is very different and very important. And I was thinking about how the guys that were soldiers that was their business to kill the enemy, blah, blah, blah. And now they come upon these, these people and their role, their mindset had to change so much. They became humanitarians. I mean, you know, forget the fighting. Oh my God, I have to. And so thank you for, you know, bringing this to the fore because it must have been a difficult role to change gears that way. Definitely, yeah, great point. I mean, especially is for the, um, for the combat operational people. You know, you're a machine gunner, you're a rifleman, um, you're a mortarman, you're a bazooka guy or whatever. That's what you're trained to do. And like the humanitarian side, that's what your medic buddies are dealing with, you know? And, uh, or maybe civil affairs or something as you, as you advance through France or wherever you've come from. Um, that is a really hard thing to kind of reorient yourself. And you've probably been sort of dehumanized yourself because your job is killing on some levels. And that, takes, that leaves a mark, you know. So um, that's why I say that it's, the Americans, a lot of the average soldiers are very amateurish the way they approach this because they, they haven't been trained, they don't know, they haven't been warned. So what's your first condition? Here's a canteen full of water, drink it all down. Here's my sea rations, here's my K-Rate. What can I do for you to help you? You know what I mean? Um, and yet, that's not the best thing sometimes. So it's. It's, it's, a, it's a horribly difficult situation. Yeah. Um, I have um, a comment and a question. Um, first of all, thank you so much for this. You know, I think we've all kind of, we've seen the pictures and heard the stories and all that. But you, with all of your, your quotes by the, the, all the soldiers and everything they said, you've taken this history and you make it personal. And when you do that, it kind of comes alive and it really resonates for us. And you take sort of this, this history that I think in your words were, was egregious and brutal and savage, 
and you just kind of make it real. So I can't imagine how many thousands of documents you've read, but thank you so much for your research and for, do, and for being here and doing this. All right. Thank you. It's an honor, absolute honor. And uh, you're right, thousands and thousands of documents and whatever else. Uh, and yeah, that, it's interesting because that's really what uh, animates me as an historian, the human personal side of whatever history we happen to be talking about. I think that's the value in it in some ways long term. I, I agree with that. Um, and I think my question sort of um, piggybacks on, on what you were asking. So I've been to Dachau, and like you said, it's you know, a short ride from Munich, and, um, and then you get there, and the camp, it's a cute little town now, and the camp's like half a mile up the road. Mm -hmm. And I think Dachau was the place where the American soldiers went into town and got the civilians and made them come back to the camp to see what had been done. And they all said, oh, we had no idea this was going on. I, I don't know if this was part of your research, but it seems impossible to me. I mean, it's right there. And I don't know, I was just wondering if you could comment on that. Yeah, so that, was, that whole element of this was part of my research. And um, I, I agree, of course, they know, because it's, a, it's an intimate town, you're not too far from Dhaka, and then eventually you have the stench. And you see the, the trains that are, that are going there, dumping people off. You know, remember, this place has been operating since 1933. Uh, so, yeah, so, so I actually, in the interest of trying to be as uh, fair and objective as possible and maybe have some empathy, too, uh, really looked into that side uh, and, and found some source material on, like, how the people of Dachau felt with, of the Nazi state's decision to locate a camp there. And there was some resistance to it. There, there was a lot of tension between the SS and the locals. Um, of course, it's like everything. There were also people who were making choices to profit off this, too. Um, so when you're a GI, you don't know who you're encountering. You may be encountering somebody, and there were some uh, at Dachau, who who's, uh, basically gave food to prisoners whenever they could. This did happen. This is documented. Um, but you also may be encountering somebody who didn't and profited from this uh, or you know helped the SS or just stood by and did nothing. But but then again, what were they going to do? That's the dilemma too, and I, that's why I say empathy. Maybe put yourself in that position of saying, you're part of this Third Reich. What can you do against the state? Um, is, how many of us are really going to rise up and say, this is wrong what's happening at Dachau. SS, come get me now. You know, I mean, that's a tough decision too. So, but, but a lot of the GIs, part of their anger was against those locals, who the fir default setting is usually, I didn't know anything about that. I'm not because they're terrified that they're, you're, they're going to you're going to haul them away and try them as a war criminal or shoot them or whatever. So they're going to claim ignorance when, of course, I mean you're 100 percent right. There's no way you couldn't know. Same dynamic at Ordruf, um, and at, at Ordruf is the first time where you see the, the American military authorities uh, basically give orders to locals saying you're going to come here and you're going to see this. And you, you can find the, that footage on, on YouTube, but I encourage you to check it out. It's really interesting. Uh, they, they get like whoever they think of as like the most prominent people locally, and then they, they force them to tour uh, Ordruf and what had happened. And obviously, that's only the beginning of, of when you're going to see that all over Germany. <clears throat> Hi, thanks for coming. And uh, my question is how long did it take before the press learned about this and wrote about it? And how do you feel about the coverage that they wrote? Was it very, very brief, or was it in detail? Yeah, so um, there's multiple layers answering the question. The, the press um, had, well before this, written stories about the Nazi persecution of the Jews in particular and, and what we'll call the Holocaust, like the, the, the real death camps in Poland and all this kind of stuff. You'd have that, but you'd really have to have kind of an eagle eye in terms of following media to really be cognizant of that as a U.S. citizen circa spring of 45, especially as a soldier. So in this other phase, once we see the camps and know this, and by the way, this is a horrifying to think of, but we're just liberating camps in Germany. The worst of them are in Poland, by far. Most of, the, most of the, uh, those who die in the Holocaust in camps happen in the death camps in the East, right? So, you know, <laughs> that's another way to just step back and say, wow. Um, so there's enormous media coverage that spring, starting with the delegations that I mentioned. And so it piggybacks and it, and it spreads out. So really interesting thing. Um, 
The, you remember, Joseph Pulitzer is, is a big part of this, and he owns uh, what is my hometown newspaper, the St. Louis Post-Dispatch. So um, they're going to bring back a lot of um, uh, photos, a lot of stories and whatnot, and they had a major exhibit in St. Louis where there's a, a very large German-American community, by the way, um, and they had people go through and look at these exhibits that summer of 1945. I think it was about well into six figures, the number of uh, St. Louisans and people from all over the area who came in to look at this. So um, St. Louis was unique maybe in that regard, but also I think that the media coverage was really quite extensive um, in, in the wake of this, and it, it'll continue. But, the, but then the story morphs into what do you do with the survivors, the displaced person problem, which we really tend to overlook. You know, Liberation Day is just one exultant day. What happens to you the rest of your life? There are people who are in DP camps for five, six, seven years after this. Um, so that's in some ways the thornier problem. So the media coverage would have pivoted to that maybe a little bit as time went on. Yeah, I have a question. The common American soldier that came there, I'm sure none of them spoke German or Yiddish or anything, although she said her father did. But how did they communicate? How did they know what's going on? Because they couldn't even talk to the prisoners, I don't think. So yeah. do you have any idea what they did or how they talked to them? Yeah, great question. I mean, that is really the great barrier you have with an American soldier, the language problem. Um, you probably would have had somebody within your unit, maybe your company, maybe your battalion, who had some German. Maybe, you know, because this was very useful in the war. And so that probably, ironically enough, would have been the way you communicated in German because the prisoners had to know German, at least some, in order to follow commands. So you have that dynamic. You've got a few who speak English. Um, and then you have Yiddish speakers here and there. I mean, you certainly do that because especially Jewish American GIs, I mean, that's not unusual. So as this whole thing sorts out, you could communicate, but it also could be very stilted at first. And that's where misconceptions come in, like Swick. I mean, Swick knows some Yiddish, but you know, he can't he's having trouble communicating with people saying, I didn't try and poison the guy, you know. I, I am a friend, I'm an American soldier, I'm a Jew, you know, please believe me, please believe me. He can't articulate that in the same way maybe we all can as English speakers, and you can immediately get that rapport with somebody. It's a really good point, because it's a it's an issue for, for the liberators especially. Not as much the witnesses, because by then, once you've got days and weeks pass by, then you've got more interpreters or you've got you know, more, more infrastructure for communication at that point. So, as the Russians were coming from the east and we were coming from the west, everyone was racing towards Berlin. Were there cases where both armies were you know, coming to a camp at the same time? And so you had both the Russian and the huh. American troops at a, at a particular camp, and how did that kind of play out. Yeah, to my knowledge, there isn't any situation where you have like US and Soviet soldiers arriving at a camp at the same time. Uh, I, I'm not saying there wasn't none. I could be ignorant of them. But to, to my knowledge, that doesn't happen. And there, Because I don't think you have the same thing with British and Americans either. I mean, the British famously liberate Bergen-Belsen. So it just tended to be wherever the armies were, where the, the camps you were gonna, going to encounter. But yeah, that would have been an interesting dynamic, for sure. <laughs> Others. Well, we'll take one more question, Jen. My father was a liberator at his third army, fourth armor division, thirty fourth signal, um, and order of Luke and Vault. Um, what is in your research, what was the hardest part about putting the pieces together? Because so many soldiers didn't talk about it, and so you're getting the side of you're getting the point of view of one soldier who did and then ones who did not. Mm -hmm. So what what was the difficulty of putting the pieces together when you had that hole in the center? Yeah, so it, just in case you didn't hear, the, the, like what's the difficulty in putting the pieces together, these various accounts and like, like sorting out what happened where and when? Um, the difficulty of really figuring out who got there first, um, which of course, yes, is pointless on some levels, but remember, you know, this is officially recognized now. I think maybe you know this, that uh, eventually the U.S. Holocaust Memorial Museum and the U.S. Army Center of Military History will converge to officially recognize at the divisional level, not anything below, uh, which units are, are, so partially that, but really more so like, who's a liberator and who's a witness, and parsing those two words out of what that means. Uh, and so what I, what I eventually arrived at was, well, a liberator is somebody who's like first into the camp kind of thing. As your father, it sounds like, was with the 4th Armored Division at Ordruf. Okay, so um, that's first on site. What are we looking at? Here's what we do you know, in, the, in this mix, and how long does that go on? Well, we could all debate that, right? Uh, maybe it's a couple of three hours, maybe it's whatever it is. 
But the much more common experience is the witnessing experience of, hey, did you hear about this place that uh, you know a company saw? You know, I mean, can we get up there and take a look at this? And it's a day or two later or something. Or you're a follow-on force and you don't know anything about it either. Uh, but it's already been liberated, and now here it is in front of you. And so you're kind of having a liberation style experience, but you're not necessarily the first one there. You're more witnessing. It just really kind of varies. So that that those little <laughs> things to parse out were really quite difficult. But also just like the, I think at some levels the most challenging thing was sort of just this this trauma of it all. Um, just just how horrifying this whole thing truly was, um, and the human side, as we discussed, how that really stays with you. And when I step back and think about that, I'm like, that's just an historian. Me, decades later, me, nobody, just thinking about this decades later, imagine the people who were really there. You know? And I, so I think in that sense, it really did sort of lock in and make me understand a little more of the whole dynamics of this. Dr. McManus, thank you so much for everything. Your speech was wonderful. We appreciate you coming down. Let's give him a round of applause, please. Thank you.